the lecture of Professor Ada Reed Jr. I'm very happy to welcome you. As you know, the Institute in every year invites a visiting fellow, someone whose work is notable for having helped with a significant part of reconceptualizing the disciplines in the humanities. And we're very happy to have Professor Reed here as a wonderful example of that. Um, I just want to make, before I have the pleasure of introducing him, I just want to make a few logistical announcements. First of all, there's a reception after the lecture and Q&A, which will be in the lecture room behind us, to which you are all invited, and we hope that you will stay. Second of all, as I'm sure you know, Professor Reed is in residence here all week, and he will be holding office hours tomorrow, Tuesday, March 2nd, from 1 to 3 right where that open door is. Um, and if you if you have any complications with that and want to speak to him, you could always speak to him directly or speak to Linda Vavra, and we'll try to help you work that out. Second, I wanted to remind everybody that he will be leading a seminar this Thursday, March 4th, from 2 to 4.30 in the Institute. And the seminar is called Anti-Racism as a Critique and a Politics. There are readings available if you choose to read them. We will help you out and, and send them to you, or we have some copies here. Then I just wanted to remind everybody, too, that this Friday and Saturday, we're having a conference at the Institute where Professor Reed, along with many other interesting people, will also be present. And it's called Neoliberalism and its Discontents. It begins Friday, March 5th at 4 p.m., also in the Institute, and will continue on Saturday from 9.30 till 2 p.m. And this has been organized by Walter Ben Michaels. And to see more details about this conference, there is a brochure that looks like this. And if you haven't received one of our thousands of mailings, you can pick one up from the table on your way out. Okay. And now, as I said, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Adolph Reed, Jr., who received his BA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, after which he went on to earn his MA and his PhD in political science from Atlanta University in 1981. Professor Reed has taught in a variety of institutions, very interestingly, beginning um, as an instructor of political science, first at Howard University, then at the Southern Center for Studies in Public Policy at Clark College, and also teaching for a year at Emory University. He became a full professor of political science and Afro-American studies at Yale, where he taught from 1988 to 1991. He then um, moved for six years to Northwestern, spent a year at UIC, I'm very glad to have him back, and two years at the New School. Currently, he's Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. A scholar of African American politics um, and intellectual history, Professor Reed has won fellowships and grants from Yale University and from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, he was also named the Carnegie Corporation Scholar of Vision for research on a project entitled Race in American Life, What It Is, What It Isn't, How It Operates, How It Doesn't. In 2003 and 4, in conjunction with Professor Ken Warren, he taught seminars on rethinking African American literary and cultural studies, which are funded by the Mellon Foundation. Adolph Reed is the author of four books, including The Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, The Crisis of Purpose in Afro-American Politics, published by Yale in 1986, and nominated for the American Political Science Association's Ralph J. Bunch Award. In 1997, he published W.E.B. Du Bois and American Political Thought, Oxford University Press, which won the National Conference of Black Political Scientists 1998 Outstanding Book Award. These books were followed by Stirrings in the Jug, Black Politics in Post-Segregation Era, um, University of Minnesota Press, 1999, and 2000, Class Notes, Posing as Politics and Other Thoughts on the American Scene, which was named by the New York Times Book Review as one of the most notable books of the year. And Professor Reed has also edited Without Justice for All, The New Liberalism and Our Retreat from Radical Equality. Um, there's also a forthcoming anthology on rethinking African American intellectual history, which Professor Reed has co-edited with Professor Ken Warren. And this collection is widely 
interdisciplinary and focuses on the centrality of politics and political economy as central considerations in the trajectory of black American thought. I should also mention um, that he has very, very much engaged in various activities in the public sphere. He has worked as a regular columnist for the Village Voice and the Progressive, and he has been a part of labor and community organizing efforts involving urban planning, poverty, community development, jobs, housing, and voter registration. He's been very active in the American Association of University Professors as well, and he serves as a member of the National Council and Executive Committee of that organization. He also has some very interesting projects in progress, and I hope that he's, I know that he will share some of this work with us while he's in residence at the Institute this week. He's currently investigating the discourses which created race as a biological category in America, focusing on the ways in which this account intersected with the development of race as an idea rooted in labor and market relations. In addition, he's studying the development of liberal and left of center ideas, such as they concern labor, civil rights, and feminism, for example, since World War II. Um, his lecture today is Obama, Anti-Racism, and Rebuilding the American Left. So please join me in, in welcoming Professor Reed. responsible for having me here and for a very generous introduction. Um, I wish I knew that guy. Uh, um, and I uh, thank all of you for coming out to hear and, and, and I hope to talk. Uh, I have, um, alas, already long since reached the point in life at which I uh, have to choose between being able to see my text carefully or being able to see people in the front rows closely. Uh, those, those, those of you in the back, given the nature of my vision de facto, not really my political imagination, I can read your mind from two blocks away, but, uh, <laughs> but from up close, uh, the, the last. Uh, and I will say as well um, that, and I mean, this is heartfelt, uh, it's, it's always very good to be back in Chicago, and it's, it's especially good to be back at UIC, um, which I think is the place where I have the warmest spot in um, in, in my professional academic life, um, and I'm not just saying that when I'm here, I can produce the witnesses from elsewhere in the country. You've heard me say that elsewhere. And I say, say that having come straight from New Orleans, where, uh, so, so, uh, so that even says, says, says more about how much it means for me to be here. Uh, anyway, as Mary Beth said, my talk today, as I guess you all know, uh, is, is, is titled Obama, Anti-Racism and Rebuilding the American Left. I thought that I'd started out like this. Um, in January of this year, after considerable prodding, curiously, I'm not sure why, she, why, you know, why Katrina was so in, insistent that I do this, I published the following comment in a Nation magazine compendium of brief reflections on, on, on Obama's first year in office. And if you can stand a little bit quoting, I'll quote, quote, quote by of me. <laughs> in January 1996, I wrote the following about Barack Obama in my Village Voice column. Quote, within the quote. Within the quote. <laughs> in Chicago, we've gotten a foretaste of the new breed of foundation-hatched black communitarian voices. One of them, a smooth Harvard lawyer with impeccable do-good credentials and vacuous to repressive neoliberal politics, has won a state senate seat on a base mainly in the liberal foundation and development worlds. The domestically bootstrap line was softened by a patina of the rhetoric of, of authentic community. Talk about meeting in kitchens, small scale solutions to social problems, and the predictable elevation of process over program, the point where identity politics emerges with old fashioned middle class reform in, in favoring form over substance. Um, I suspect that his ilk is the wave of the future in US black politics. Um, in, in the quote of me. I went on in, in, in this nation comment to say, um, in, Matt Ta in uh, 2007, Matt Taibbi described him as, quote, an ingeniously crafted human cipher, a man without race, ideology, 
ge uh, ge geographic allegiances or indeed sharp edges of any kind. You can't run against them on the issues because you can't even find them on the ideological spectrum. And the quote of Taibbi. In 2006, Ken Silverstein noted Obama's deep financial industry connections. Uh, the, um, Glenn Ford, Paul Street, and, and many others have, have stressed those and other disturbing connections, including his penchant for supporting more conservative Democratic candidates against more liberal ones. Obama indicated no later than, than the summer uh, of 2007 that he intended, if elected, to extend the war in Afghanistan into Pakistan. Um, and he did it in, in the New York Times, which, as everyone knows, is the newspaper of the record. The, the only surprise about his presidency, therefore, is how many ersatz leftists cling to the fiction that he's anything other than a superficially articulate ne neoliberal de Democrat in the Clinton mold, and, and his administration would act, act in any other way. End, end all the quotes. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't quote myself here to toot my own horn for prescience about Obama's limitations as a standard bearer for progressive or left of center political interests. As some of you know, I just happened to be around and rather closely engaged in the politics of the 13th State Senate District at the birth of Obama's political career. So I saw it up, up close and personal. Indeed, the point of the comment is that those limitations were readily visible to anyone with reasonable political sophistication who cared to notice. This is the point at which the Obama phenomenon, or Obama mania, as it has been pithily described, is of interest for the project of assessing the character and status of the left in American politics and the challenge of building an effective political opposition to advancing neoliberalism. More to the point, uh, the the, the, the question with which I'm concerned, with which I'm concerned regarding Barack Obama and his presidency, is really what the mystique and mystifications around him say about the state of the left as an avant-garde force in American political life. Um, the interesting questions that is are how and why so many self-proclaimed leftists or progressives, um, individuals, institutions, and and organizations, the erstwhile avatars of of left opinion such as the Nation came to be swept up in the extravagant rhetoric and expectations that surrounded Obama's campaign, his election, and, and his presidency. <laughs> so answering those questions, I think, requires taking stock of what has happened to the left as both institutions and an idea in the U.S. in the last three decades, because the tendency to overstate the significance of, of Obama's election and presidency, I, I will argue, um, when all said and done, reflects those changes. I want to be clear also that I don't contend that Obama and his campaign duped or simply co-opted unsuspecting radicals. On the contrary, Obama's been clear all along that he's not a leftist. Um, if he hadn't been clear before, he made it very clear uh, in, you know, by June, June of 08, um, you know, you know, once he'd wrapped up the nomination. But throughout his career, actually, he's carefully distanced himself from left or radical politics. In his books, um, and, and, and speeches, he's frequently drawn on stereotypical images of left dogmatism, intemperateness, or folly, often when not as part of rhetorically pretentious, uh, jingoist oratory extolling the superiority of American political and economic institutions as gratuitous asides that seem intended mainly to reassure conservative sensibilities um, about, his, uh, his, um, about his judiciousness. Rather, as Booker T. Washington used black chicken stealing stereotypes to establish his bona fides with, with, with his segregationist audiences. This, this inclination to toss off casual references to the left's excesses or, or socialism's failure has been a defining element of Brand Obama and connects with the claim that he is a new kind of pragmatic progressive who is singularly um, capable of bridging or rising above left and right to appeal across ideological divisions. Assertions that Obama possesses this singular ability contributed to Obama mania by supporting claims that he was electable and once elected capable of forging a new visionary post-partisan consensus. Anybody remember this? Uh, this? This feature of brand Obama even suffused the enthusiasm of, of those who identify as leftists. Belief in his special ability was ultimately belief that Obama was a progressive who actually could win the presidency thus clearing the, the electoral hurdle that the likes of J Jesse Jackson, Ralph Nader, or other, or other nominally progressive candidates couldn't cross. Yet few acknowledged 
e either the extent to which claims of Obama's potential for, for, for broad appeal hinged on his disavowals of, of left excesses, or that that fact had likely programmatic political implications that were in conflict with, with commitment to, to uh, the vision of social transformation along what historically have been considered leftist lines. What kind of progressive pursues a political strategy of distancing himself from the left by rehearsing hack, hackneyed stereotypes or hackneyed conservative stereotypes? What, what imperative should we expect to guide such, such a nominal progressive's approach to governing? And even granting the never quite demonstrated assertions that Obama is in his heart of hearts, again, a trope uh, that should be familiar from the Clinton administration, we might recall, committed to a progressive agenda, how would a coalition built so centrally on, on, on reassuring conservatives um, not seriously constrain the administration's policy horizons? What, moreover, does it mean to identify as a leftist if one accepts disparaging the left as, as a foundation of a candidate's desirability? Now, to be sure, the level of generality at which Obama laid out his, his, his vision helped to avoid such questions. Um, his books are performances of a posture, not substantive articulations of, of a social program. And the posture is high-minded reasonableness um, and, a, and a subtle projection of his biographical narrative and identity as embodying progressive and, and or transformational politics. Uh, and sometimes the projection has, has been not quite so subtle. Unsurprisingly, therefore, there's little with which to disagree in those books. They are crafted, um, they, they, they're, they are crafted ultimately toward producing precisely that effect. This has, this has made it easier for people to project their, their hopes and dreams onto him. The, the persona he created, as Taibbi notes, is a cipher. Yet, although ideology is powerful, people aren't simply duped or stupid or entirely given over to popular de delusion, at least not in such great numbers or for so long. So sustaining a will to believe that's powerful enough to overcome the Democrats' actual record uh, uh, will ult has ultimately required more than you know, more than hyperbolic bluster and political amnesia. This faith um, also has material foundations, which, but which, which I'd like to lay out at least an outline. Um, first of all, official representatives of left of center institutional constituencies, and we and we have to understand right that that the way we think about left politics in the U.S. in the last two decades has has tended to mute the distinction between uh, voices that, that, that have constituencies and, and voices that don't. And I'd like to talk first about the voices that have, you know, that have constituencies. Um, official representatives of, of elective center institutional constituencies generally approach electoral politics with a cost-benefit calculus focused, that's focused disproportionately on immediate perils and benefits. Um, that this is partly because incumbent leaders are accountable to actual organizational bases that have the power to affirm or terminate their incumbency. In the case of the labor movement, for instance, it's voting members. Um, in, in, in the case, or, and it's sort of more diffuse hybrids of members and funders with regard to, to those entities like the civil rights, uh, civil rights movement. <coughs> or whatever you want to call it these days, bless you, uh, the, the you know, women's movement, environmentalist, and other progressive public interest and advocacy organizations. But this accountability inclines them toward both a political judiciousness and, and pragmatic stress on immediate and short-term potential for, for gains and losses. In, in, in itself, I want to insist that this is a healthy disposition. And in any case, it, it, it provides political action with an important leavening of practicality. I think here of a good colleague and, uh, and political ally of mine who, was, who uh, um, came from the left and salted within a 5,000 member union local in New York. He won the presidency. He was, he was re-elected to the presidency. And he signed up the local on one too many free, free Mumia Abu Jamal petitions. And and uh, and uh, you know, now he's 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 back on the line as a mail handler because um, uh, he lost by more more than three fourths of uh, of the vote in his local and and he lost the base uh, you know the base 
But in any case, this sort of practical, um, um, this concern of practicality is unavoidable. It's a necessary feature of holding or attempting to build a real base of support. And, and in activist politics, it's not qualified by, it, by instrumental concerns, it is not a serious politics at all at the end of the day. However, for reasons too complex to attempt to lay out now, those institutional actors and the individuals who represent them have long since abandoned any notion of a political strategy that's not predicated on electing Democrats as the sine qua non for, for the exercise of effective political agency. That is, those organizational, um, those organizational elites, by and large, have long since committed to a politics that folds the what we want component of agenda setting entirely into the ostensibly pragmatic what we think we can get from elected Democrats. That commitment to a cue taking instead of cue giving role in a democratic coalition whose center of gravity moves, moves more and more rightward impels uh, stressing the importance of electing the current de Democrat to the point of wild exaggeration. As we've seen with the Clinton administration and, and uh, now the Obama administration, the extravagant claims propagated to, to constituents during the election campaign undercut uh, the le leader's abilities to criticize or dissent from, from the Democrats once elected. It's very difficult, as, as I'm sure the United Auto Workers, um, the, the, the two main t teachers unions, and probably others, no, no doubt experienced already in Obama's <coughs> first several months, to return to the same constituents and admit that, 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 that the Democrat whose election won its sold to the key to progress and protection has not come through and may threaten in, in, in some ways to make things worse. How do you do that, right? I mean, the only way you go back to constituents and say that is, in effect, to admit that you're incompetent or that, that you lied to them. And if they get the vote on you, then you're going to be you know, back on the rails again. All right. Anticipation of jobs and access that the Democratic victory supposedly will make available also helps to cement the will to believe, like especially in our class, because that's what our class does. At least since Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign, the, uh, uh, the Democratic candidates considered serious have insisted that because appealing to the right's agenda is necessary to win, the responsible left <coughs> must forego demands for, for specific policies or, or programs um, to, uh, as quid pro quo for their support. As the Obama administration's reaction to emerging criticism of his pathetic health care reform, and let, 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 let me just back up and sort of let that phrase sink in for effect, <laughs> his pathetic health care reform um, shows what, uh, how re responsible is defined tautologically as those who support the administration without criticism. Those, those who do not are therefore, by, de de by that definition, the far left. Uh, and um, you know, I don't know how m many of, of the rest of you have had any live, real-time experience with R Rahm Emanuel. But I, mean, I had a little bit back do during the 1992 campaign when he was Clinton's shill, and I was Tom Harkins. And I've been showering with, with a Brillo pad at least once a week ever since then. <laughs> um, but. Um, Clinton and his minions made clear as well that those who objected to that stipulation risked, risked being denied access to the administration. Anonymous sources in that world re report that institutional memory or lore of having been frozen out of the Clinton administration after persisting with opposition to NAFTA made staff of at least one left of center think tank that I can't name uh, to, to protect my, my source. Reluctant to criticize Obama's quick right return after securing the nomination, so the tendency to acquiesce in self-censorship and self-censorship and political narrowness is reinforced within the professional managerial strata, in particular by a naive but tellingly resilient view that that political change is made or 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 can be by smart progressives who feed clever policy proposals to open-minded to open-minded liberal officials. That's one of my favorites. Uh, 
about which more in a couple of minutes. Uh, this view of, of politics emerges naturally from the technocratic social vision around which those, th those, those strata cohere both practically and ideologically. It's a view that reflects the professional managerial classes, so the, the professional managerial classes, social position, and the rhetoric of special skill or cultural capital that grounds its, its discourses of mutual recognition and legitimation. It, it is also a view that can engender aspirations to prestigious appointments or, or advisory positions and which in turn can fuel especially intense ardor in fulfilling the candidate's demands for absolute unquestioning fealty. Just for the record, um, Eichmann came out of this class. But um, such, such aspirants who typically have nurtured, or, or at least Heidegger, uh, such, <laughs> such, such aspirants who, tip, who typically have nurtured their yearnings in elite universities or the policy wonk left or both can be among the most insistent in, uh, de in denouncing as irresponsible and politically immature left criticism of the Democrat of the moment. They also have a disproportionately loud and persuasive voice in public political discourse because of their comparatively greater political attentiveness and, and, and connections, and to that extent perform something of an opinion leading role, for example, in explaining to the rest of us why the filibuster proof Senate majority is so important or how Obama shows his political adeptness in not standing for anything. Um, at the same time, uh, the main or the most visible organs of left analysis and commentary have reflected, abetted, and spurred this tendency by projecting it as, as a default common sense of progressive political thinking and, and practice. For nearly all the 20th century, there was a dynamic, though by no means widely influential, left public sphere in the U.S. that pivoted on presumed commitment to an insurgent or a radically oppositional left politics. But then, um, you know, over the 1980s and the early 1990s, much of the institutional framework of journals and magazines, uh, the Samizdat style pu publications, and the like that had sustained this left public sphere, um, either disappeared, repositioned themselves near the orbit of respectable liberal opinion, or drifted toward the her hermetically sectarian margins. Now, yeah, now I don't want to overclaim this. I mean, to be sure, the shift was not complete. Publications like New Left Review, Science and Society, Monthly Review, and others maintained the left oppositional stance. And re Rethinking Marxism, for instance, began its um, pu publication during that period. However, the center of gravity of what was recognized as left public discourse more generally came increasingly to be defined by support for democratic policy agendas. Persisting shell shock at Reaganism's ideological and programmatic victory and, and fears of a relentless Republican ju juggernaut exerted pressure toward defensiveness in politics. Uh, I know a lot of us you know, lived that. I know I did. And so um, this is either in the spirit of self-criticism self or, you know, mea culpa. But, um, I, um, and Re Reaganism's, um, but a tendency to focus on the immediate goal of electing de Democrats to stem or slow the right were tied. As this defensive orientation overtook left of, left of center interest groups, institutions, and, and opinion leading organizations, it, it increasingly came to anchor left journalistic commentary and criticism. New editorial voices, for, uh, you know, for example, the American Prospect, um, it emerged to articulate this stance of an intellectual left that defined itself in dialogue with liberals instead of radicals. And existing ones like the nation also sought to broaden to broaden their audience in that direction and become thereby influential in liberal policy discourse and commentary. The shift in the center of gravity of the left public sphere reflected, validated, and reinforced the publicly visible and self-identified left less retraction toward accommodation to or, absor or absorption within, within democratic liberalism. Although it's typically defended in a language of political practicality and sophistication, this shift r requires, as Russell Jacoby notes in a book called The End of Utopia, Abjuring what he describes as, as a belief that the future could be fundament or that the future could fundamentally surpass the present, an essential foundation, as he notes, of 
left thought and practice. Um, you know, Jacoby also observes that instead of championing a radical idea of, an, of a new society, the left, in, the left in, ineluctably retreats to smaller ideas, seeking to expand the options with, within the existing society." Um, end quote. How then is it possible to, to distinguish left from liberal? As the common conflation of the two in popular discussion suggests, in strictly empirical terms, it's not possible. Uh, li uh, li liberal incrementalism defines the horizon of, of, of left political imagination. And it's no longer reasonable to contend that there is a left, at least not in the way that that notion has been understood, has been understood historically in the United States that exists as, as a coherent or at all efficacious force in either political or cultural terms. So I'll just put that one down. Um, you know, I, well, I can repeat it if you want, but I'm not so weak, uh, um, More precisely, there is no, no institutionally or intellectually significant center of political agency that's anchored to strategic pursuit of an anti-capitalist ideological and programmatic vision, okay? So to return to the problem posed at the beginning of this talk then, the ultimate reason so many self-proclaimed leftists or progressives were, were susceptible to the hype and irrational exuberance of Obama mania is that the idea of the left has been evacuated of programmatic meaning. Without a foundation in a specific vision of a better form of society, what passes for a left has no, no normative rudder to guide coherent strategic evaluation of political programs and, and stances. The terms left and Progressive and impractical usage of the latter is is only yet yet a, a is only a yet more milk toast version of the former. Now more likely signify an affective sensibility or a preferred self perception than commitment to a concrete agenda or a systematic critique of social order. Because only the right proceeds from a clear utopian vision, left has has come to mean you know not much more than not right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. thus, thus, notwithstanding its penchant for overheated um, accusation that critics of de Democrats' inadequacies irresponsibly abet the right, this is a leftism that, that in effect, cedes the definition of its own boundaries to, to its opposition. M moreover, in a political context defined by a seemingly contradictory combination of intensifying polarization along partisan lines mm -hmm. and the two parties um, increasing convergence um, with, with respect to policy orientation, the areas of fundamental disagreement that separate then become arcane and too remote from most people's experience and, and concerns to inspire, to inspire um, your real commitment, much less popular action. To that extent, the strategies and allegiances become mercurial and opportunistic. And Popular politics is ever more candidate-centered and, and driven by fan-like enthusiasms about individuals, or more, or more um, precisely, of, about the idealized and, and, and evanescent personae that, that is the p political holograms that those, that those individuals and their packages project. As the human cipher that Taibbi described, Obama is the pure product and creature of this hollowed out politics. Not only is he or his image crafted entirely to, to stoke this kind of superficial affect, um, driven by platitudinous nouns and a bunch of adjectives, um, he is, for, uh, for uh, the Simpsons geeks in the room, he is the singular embodiment of Kong and Kodos. Um, o Obama mania is, it is also a triumph of, of identity and image um, above content. In, indeed, it's a triumph of identity as content. In particular, o Obama's political persona has depended partly on on deploying his, his racial identity 
a self-evident embodiment of the claim that he's a progressive, albeit one of, of, of a supposedly new and improved kind. He's been able to advocate um, a considerable number of stances and pursue actions that seem to be at, at, at odds with the left agenda or, or perspective. And, 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 and as I've said, uh, we seek re rapprochement with, with, with conservatives with, without calling into question the claim to be a progressive, partly because the notion has no clear meaning, but also partly because he is not, he's not nominally black. His, his racial classification combines with a narrative of, of, of self-presentation that includes his past as, as a community organizer to construct an image that conveys a sensation of a politics, much, much in the way that advertising presents the commodity as, as the material condensation of inchoate desire. Cultural scripts concerning the significance of election of a black president encourage a fervor that washes away the, the distinction between sensation and substance. And tellingly, Obama has, has responded to criticisms of his actions commonly with ostensibly legitimizing assertions of facets of his identity. So Obama mania in this way re reflects the debasement of, of the notion of a political left, its separation from concrete vision or program, and its reformulation entirely within the discourse of identity. This discourse, notwithstanding its familiar association with groups defined by some history of discrimination or subordination, is not intrinsically linked, however, to any particular punitive moral rehabilitation um, that, that displaces or purports to invalidate politics just as easily as it can link to an explicitly political program at, at all. In fact, the extent to which it seems to link to political engagement depends largely on nostalgic reconstructions of past social insurgencies that, retro, that, that retrofit them with, with, an, with um, a logic and, and, or with an, an imminent logic and, and, and imagery of past social insurgency or, or, or that's, that, that's compatible with the neoliberalism's successful de deprecation of, of institutionally grounded collective action and public life in general. That reconstruction has been both reflected in and driven, and driven intellectually by developments uh, that, that have emerged from, you know, from the university-based left in uh, the last three decades. Now, th this isn't going to be well, what a beat up on the audience moment, or I don't think, or, or at least I hope not. But, uh, and, it, and, and if it starts to feel like it, can keep in mind that that then I want to be too. Um, but all right, so during, during the 18 or during, during the 1980s, 1990s, and an interpretive regime took shape in American in American academic life that sort um, that sort to val that sort to valorize um, um, what would have been described as 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 everyday acts of resistance and of the local struggles as the authentic foundations of popular insurgencies such as the labor movement and the post-war civil rights movement. This regime's intellectual origins are, are, are various, but re references to and extrapolations from, from, um, from the political scientist and my former colleague James C. Scott's um, um, work on the dynamics of rebellion and acquiescence and negotiations within within hegemonic systems, right? The you know, weapons of the weak uh, among peasants in Southeast Asia figured as something of a proximate touchstone for the scholars who who elaborated this interpretive tendencies. Scott's significance for those who wrote about the United States, however, stemmed less from systematic engagement with his work than from appropriation of certain of his formulations. Among these were the notion of the hidden transcript through which the oppressed communicate their um, sincere beliefs and the related idea that sub subordinate populations subvert their oppression in indirect ways and are not entirely powerless and complicit even when unable to express their discontent through public political action. Along with invocations of Gramsci, these four formulations appeal to an ostensibly populist sensibility that also had had some intellectual roots in the turn to social and cultural history in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and that and that 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 
prior turn also had reflected you know, the influence of the social insurgencies of the 1960s. But by the mid to late 1980s, fields of study associated with subject matter evocative of, of, um, of, of those movements from the 60s, uh, the African American studies, ethnic studies, and women's studies, became Blackness and, and, and the culture war, which raised the political profile and temperature of, 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 of academic debates by construing the university as a prime battlefield in larger ideological struggle. In this environment, academic reconstruction of past insurgencies and, and debates over specific re reconstructions vied, if not to occupy the iconic space that the actual movements once had occupied, at at, at least to replicate and fill it and, and fill it in the smaller kind of solipsistic um, world that, that we, we live in um, you know that, um, in the academy <coughs> moreover as those fields of study became institutionalized the competition for the academic resources institutional re recognition and uh, legitimacy faculty lines and salaries grad programs and research centers in which they were enmeshed also seemed re reminiscent of, of, of the insurgent struggles that were associated with their objects of study. In those competitive processes, um, um, it, um, arguments for resources tend to ver or to veer rather into calls for re recognition and vice versa. So, from this perspective, the politically tinged controversies con concerning concerning the it, the intellectual status of cultural studies, African American studies, women's studies, and um, and such fields, reinforced perception of them among the among their partisans at any rate, as instances or continuations of the social and political insurgencies whose auras and moral force they annex through conceptual elision. Just as significant as this elision of the distinction between writing about political movements. And, and making them, though, is that it has gone largely unnoticed. <laughs> this is partly due to the fact that 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 the fields that I mentioned uh, had 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 for the most part um, originated out of the respective political movements, and their founding legitimations had been linked to claims of connection to those movements and and the popular constituencies they claimed or once claimed. That historical identification provided a discursive and ideological precedent that enabled assimilation of the subsequent association as unquestioned common sense. Folk knowledge, right? It's true because you know it's true because you know it's true. However, confounding of the ersatz politics of academic positioning and broader struggles for social justice rests on, on an active intellectual as well as as, an, as a sociological foundation, as an element in, in, in the dynamic of their institutionalization within the academic mainstream, the fields historically associated with extramural insurgencies became sites for contestation over the extent to which, uh, to which the f familiar political or Ken Warren's characterization, uh, the c community service uh, you know, legitimations should continue to ground claims for institutional re recognition. Much as um, much as uh, the structuralist uh, 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 the structuralist Marxism or 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 neo Marxism, um, you know that is a Marxism shorn of commitment to class struggle as as an epistemic point of orientation, had appealed to a cohort of scholars entering the academy in in uh, the afterglow of the ferment of the 1960s movements, who were concerned to as I you described it elsewhere to harmonize their intellectual and political interests and to secure a place for left perspectives in mainstream academic discourses. By the end of the 1980s, a turn to a discourse of cultural <coughs> studies, bless you, uh, a turn to a discourse of cultural studies inflected with postmodernist the theoretical sensibility promised to harmonize um, political and, 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 and intellectual concerns and to solidify academic standing. This turn appealed in part because its grounding in high theory betokened a kind of academic legitimacy. 
it, it also came with the aura of an intellectual avant-garde that, that comported well with the Newfield sense of their own, of their own insurgent position within the academy. Of greater political significance, though, was that cultural studies discourse at the same time in, encouraged, encouraged a radical, in fact, one might say a promiscuous, expansion of the universe of the political to the extent of defining the scholarly practice in, in itself as a political intervention. This helped to address a conundrum that, that the atrophy of, of political dynamism outside the university had posed for both the populist le legitimations of the newly institutionalized fields and, and the structuralist Marxism. For the former, um, a steady attenuation of visible extramural political activism put increasing pressure on claims based on asserted links to authentic popular voices. For the latter, as sources of left opposition elsewhere in the society disappeared, that, that, that left academic perspective, that is the structuralist Marxist one, um, with, with Yes, with, without the intellectual commitment to class struggle that I mean, Alvin Guldner had, had defined as the central, as, as the central, as, uh, as the central um, interest or the value grounding of Marxist structuralism, um, I mean, structuralist Mar um, uh, the structuralist Marxism with, with, without that commitment couldn't overcome you know, structuralism's bias toward predicting Continuities and there and there therefore um, could imagine no loci of, of effective political agency capable of de deviating from, much less mounting um, um, a challenge to the imperatives of bourgeois hegemony. In its substantive political warrants, um, that compromised academic leftism thus that differed little from accommodationist li liberalism. However, the discourse of cultural studies did not so much resolve the conundrum as sidestep it by re redefining politics and political agency. Appropriation of Foucauldian and post-structuralist interpretive styles, and I want to be very clear, I, I, am, I am in no way proposing that I'm competent to parse um, those, uh, you know, the sources, uh, but, but, but I'm talking about the appropriation. Um, nor will I ever be. Uh, anyway, in, encourage treating production and criticism of, of academic texts as a form of political engagement on par with any other. In, in addition, postmodernist sensibility en enabled broadening the idea of, of the political to apply universally to relations of dominance and and uh, subordination, or 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 centrality and 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 uh, the marginality. Postmodernist theories of political change in, indulge in what Madhu Dube, uh, who can now slink out of the Roman embarrassment if she's you know, still here, um, has has described as a romance of the residual. A tendency to bank their hopes on re on re residual or or sur surplus or surplus areas that are placed outside the prevailing system. End quote. Um, now, uh, this elevation of the residual or the marginal meshed with the normative commitment to examining the local and quotidian around which a strain of left academic practice cohered and raised uncovering patterns of popular or everyday cultural re resistance to a philosophical principle. The fact that, as uh, again Dubé notes, quote, those residual and surplus zones are generally inhabited by people who epitomize ra racial difference from the West, end quote, further buttressed postmodernist leftism's appeal and, and uh, provided a rhetoric of justification for di disciplinary projects, hybrid it, hybrid intellectual and, and political, based on specifying and articulating the characteristics and, and, and interests of groups um, defined by ascriptive identities. This rhetoric had the useful feature of, of melding claims draw, drawn from high theory <coughs> with uh, familiar justifications based on moral obligation or community service in Ken Warren's 
um, phrase again, thus transcending anxiety or conflict um, um, about the ter terms of academic institutionalization. The extent to which, to, to which academic production and positional struggles for institutional re recognition have taken on larger significance as theaters of, of, of political action in this discursive community's purview is reflected in its exponent's um, curious penchant for hortatory populist de declarations driven by arcane, often impenetrably rarefied languages of criticism and analysis. This is a Mandarin populism of, by, and for professors and graduate students. It's, it's Mandarin as well in its relation to the popular constituencies whose voices and, and, and interests it purports to represent. For despite the no doubt heartfelt proclamations of respect and a regard for the experiences and perspectives of the ordinary people that typically underpin it, this discourse's insistence that art and, and uh, the ostensibly private, um, indirect, um, uh, the, the quotidian, and, and, uh, and, and uh, the surreptitious are the domains of authentic political expression among the marginalized grounds and interpretive sleight of hand that has more in common with ventriloquy than with uh, the putative objective of giving voice to the voices. In, insofar as it's rooted in art rather than, than, than the realm of public institutional action, this, this idea of politics, uh, again, Ken, uh, you know, Ken Warren points out, quote, tends to get reduced to a matter of meaningful aesthetic expression and the correct exegesis of, of that expression rather than, than concerted action uh, directed toward definable goals, end quote. And because it assigns definitive political agency to suppress populations held to express themselves, through indirect, ostensibly apolitical, and ultimately Aesopian means, this politics, uh, this politics requires the mediation of expert interpreters to render its hi hidden transcripts publicly, re publicly recognizable as political expression. Warren observes re regarding black cultural studies, and in particular, that, quote, the act of aligning oneself with the putatively distinct and re relatively autonomous cultural styles emerging from below has been brandished, at, brandished as if this alignment guaranteed a proxy from the working class, even when no power had, had actually been ceded to black laborers." End quote. But on what basis do such professors claim qualification as, as interpreters of a popular politics that is by their own, own, own account hidden and, and opaque? Ken Warren also provides a response to that question through a critique that, while centered on the on on the intellectual historiography of black black studies and and uh, and um, lit studies in the academy in particular, I I think also has much wider ramifications. Um, I I take up his um, argument and 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 its implications more more extensively um, in in my Obama Mania book in progress, but for now. Uh, you know, three points are especially salient. First, he observes that far from being a novel intervention advanced by proponents of the cultural studies turn in black intellectual discourse, the claim to represent or, or give voice to the hidden, obscured, or misrepresented concerns and interests of more general black populations has been a staple of race-conscious black intellectual practice since the early 20th century. This is, as he, he also indicates, a class project. It, it originated as a rhetorical condensation point of, of the program of a politicized black American um, elite that at the dawn of, of the 20th century, under the banner of racial uplift and the context of massive disfranchisement and, civic, and, and, and the civic suppression of blacks in the South, uh, sought as in what in 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 what Warren's uh, terms sought a uh, substitution of black professionals, managers, and and intellectuals for their white counterparts within those institutions charged with with administering to the needs of black populations. End quote. To the extent that black scholarly activity has been driven by concern with with advancement of the race, it has tended to move in the orbit of this politics. 
a crucial project of which from the outset has been pursued and again, I'll quote him, or I'll quote Ken Warren, um, of, of um, a managerial authority, um, uh, uh, um, a managerial authority over the nation's Negro problem. End quote. Second, he contends that the claims to speak for a larger anonymous black population have depended um, characteristically on positing an authentic or coherent group culture as as the baseline of inquiry or strategic assertions concerning black American experience. This notion of a racial group culture has encompassed and blended aesthetic, anthropological, and romantic understandings of culture, with the aesthetic often standing in for the latter two. It is posited as an ideal to be attained and an empirical reality, and often both at the same time. It, it is a homogenizing principle that makes claims to speak for a larger population with, 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 without consultation, or, or without um, demonstrated evidence of popular participation seem, seem plausible by, by grounding those claims a priori on a presumption of transcendent ontological unity as the essential truth of black American life. Third, what Warren acknowledges that notwithstanding the distorting implications of its class character, at, at, at the moment of its emergence after the defeat of Reconstruction, the intellectual posture of speaking for black Americans writ large with, with, without demonstrable proxy was a not unreasonable adaptation to black Americans' mass disfranchisement and expulsion from civic life. Not only had the white supremacist counter-revolution all but eliminated space for popular black participation in public life and, and politics, the prevailing racial liberalism of the day cohered around conviction shared by black and white, white elites alike that, that, that races are natural groups joined, joined by distinct temperaments or ideals, and that the interests and capabilities of, of a group are unproblematically and most effectively expressed by its um, higher strata, its best men, and perhaps occasionally women. Both these justifications, however, long since have lost their force. Uh, the racialist ideologies of the sort that underwrote notions of racial temperament are no longer acceptable in, in the respectable intellectual circles, certainly not in li liberal ones, at least you know, not for the moment. In the wake of the victories of, of, of the civil rights movement that restored and amplified uh, the black Americans' effective capacities for public assertion of civic voice, it is also, or should be, um, indefensible simply to assume that black people are incapable of expressing their preferences, their, their, um, you know, their concerns, or, or, or their political interests directly and explicitly. Warren contends that the privileging of artistic production and reading a politically evocative resistance into quotidian behavior as the epitome of, 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 of black political activity it implies that, quote, uh, dry languages of law and politics were always inadequate to black expression, and that the most consequential black, black political utterances have always adhered to cultural forms awaiting their astute interpreter." End quote. He concludes that because there is no basis in historical reality or necessity for doing so at this point, insisting that the realms of culture or, or quotidian life are the sites of authentic black political expression, um, ultimately presumes enslavement or comparably suppressed conditions uh, and therefore in, incapacity for direct <coughs> civic expression as black Americans' natural political condition. Now th this is a powerful and important observation. I think among its implications uh, is that this turn in in, in um, this turn in academic leftism asserts a notion of, of, of a racially authentic black expression that is fundamentally and ironically, in light of its adherence, propensities to expatiate on the moral and intellectual urgency of, um, of, of, of um, honoring the plebeian voices, it's ironically um, anti-democratic. Its anti-democratic commitment, moreover, rests on and, and is naturalized by the equivalent of the Victorian notions of race temperament or, or organic group ideals. Um, instructively, proponents have adduced various fo formulations or 
or interpretive epicycles. For example, strategic essentialism, you know, standpoint theory, or th theories of intersectionality, to rescue the discourses associated with the culturalist turn from 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 charges that that they re that they re reproduce Victorian essentialisms. However, uh, however, under scrutiny, those interventions um, amount to um, not much more than subterfuge, just uh, you know, more or less. Not more or less, not naive layers of of, of what I think are um, ultimately um, you know, ultimately specious qualification. For instance, to, uh, you know, to note that perspective is shaped by standpoint doesn't vindicate a claim that race, gender, or or it 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 or any other category of ascribed identity confers on those assigned to the category of a particular perspective that can be known a priori. Uh, strategic essentialism acknowledges that such claims are false, but contends that, that uh, for political reasons they should be treated as, as true nonetheless. Um, the, uh, and uh, the notion of, it, of intersectionality purports to correct the erroneous presumption that populations, that populations de defined via category of ascriptive identity cohere around singular group perspectives by, by multiplying the number of categories of identity held to share such definitive perspectives and then making up just those stories about how they combine. The, these moves, which amount to affirming commitment to Victorian, to Victorian essentialism through, through superficial efforts to deny it, su suggest that it's held with considerable intensity. <coughs> It's especially apt that Warren links this, this, this strain of academic leftism to the political discourse that emerged uh, among post-Reconstruction black elites because each emerged in and presumes a moment of popular demobilization. This is the crucial and the politically significant fact of, of the culturalist turn, not only in African American studies, but in what has become the modal discourse of, of a left intellectual life more, more broadly, both within the university and beyond. The, the disconnection of speaking for from the need for re representative processes or other pu publicly available mechanisms of accountability to the spoken for presumes that the latter are mute in civic life and are at best cue takers from the putatively rep representative um, speakers. To be sure, the discourses of the identitarian left in the university do not shape national public discourse. We just aren't that, that cool. Uh, I, I, mean, like it, um, I mean, like as I often say about um, you know, my own um, worthless discipline, uh, what's, you know, the nod to a co-sufferer out there. Uh, while we, while we, we like to think that we shape what, 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 what gets written on the op-ed page of the New York Times as much more the case that we are uh, shaped by what, what, what gets written on the page of the New York Times. So, so, so I'm not making that point, but, but I am contending that with the atrophy of, of an extramural left, these discourses that begin in the academy, and for the reasons I suggested um, you know, a while back, um, that, that you have to do with the positioning of, of, of of, of the class that produces the discourses, um, not only you know, not only do these uh, you know, discourses increasingly re uh, in, in increasingly reflect, but but uh, but but I think are also an active, dynamic, and constitutive node um, in in re reproducing um, the pro programmatic accommodations that are the substance of neoliberal of American neoliberal. Hegemony. Now, so so I put the real well, I put the real N word on the table now, and 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 I think I want to talk about that just for a couple of minutes. I promise I'm not going to go on much longer, which is probably the deadliest thing an academic can ever say. Um, <laughs> but um, but I want to make a couple. Well, yeah yeah yeah. I want to make a couple of quick points about this. One is 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 just to kind of think for a second about 
how it's helpful for us to think about ne neoliberalism. Um, as you know, some of you heard me say this before, but but I especially like the pithy way that D David Harvey uh, kind of condenses ne uh, condenses ne neoliberalism down to two moments. Right, one 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 is a political utopia. Right, that that's that that rests on a sanctification of the market. Right. And the other is a practical program for the upward transfer of resources. And they swim along together, and as Harvey points out, except when there's a conflict, I'm guess which one wins. <laughs> um, and that speaks to my other point, right? Because I think if we think about neoliberalism, right, uh, in 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 the lower case, right, um, as as an historically you know, specific kind of regime, right, that sort of fills in, you know, within a given society, how how um, you know these two essential components work and are um, and 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 are understood to fit together. Um, then I think we kind of get what well, I think it helps to get a picture of the claim that I'm making that. Um, that in the U.S. as elsewhere, um, what we can summarize now as a neoliberal order or 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 a regime um, has emerged out of contestation between um, the already existing so, so social forces, and 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 it's been crafted partly through ma through man making use of extant patterns of social relations and extant ideologies. From, from that perspective, I think what we've seen happening is that from the mid-1980s, um, you know, we've, you know, we've seen a tendency uh, within um, um, the democratic, uh, with, within the democratic, li uh, li uh, pardon me, within the democratic li liberalism, right, to accommodate uh, you know, neoliberal um, um, to accommodate ne neoliberal economic and ideological hegemony by filling in um, historically appropriate metrics of fairness and so and so social justice, right? That would be consistent with, with the large-scale principle of of the free market utopia, right? Um, in in, uh, and, and I think in that context, there are a couple of me meaningful interventions. One is, is, is a continuing breakdown of the Fordist interest group system. In, uh, and, and, and how that plays in is that um, as those groups, as, as those recognized centers of interest have increasingly um, experienced de demobilization of their own bases, Right, um, they they and their reps that, that that is those institutions and their human rep and their human representatives have come increasingly to act like like, like the sort of unaccountable spokespersons, right? Uh, that that I described are posited in this framework of cultural politics. Um, that, that is to say that they um, that the trajectory of 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 the vector of of their rep representation has come has has come increasingly to to be that they take messages from the governing centers to their constituencies uh, you know, more than than the other way around and uh, you know, Matt Bai did a really insipid article that's redundant um, in the New York Times Magazine I think in 08. Um, called "Is Obama the End of Black Politics?" in in which he touts, but right, this 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 decade's version of or this five years um, form of the new black politics by uh, saying that where the old black politicians were rep representatives from the black community, the new black politicians are rep representatives to the black community. Although he neglected to tell us who they were from, but but and that's but but that's kind of the point. The, and I think the other point is that the successes, partial as they were, but real at the same time, 
of the civil rights movement and the women's movement and um, and the others have um, have 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 morphed in this context, and maybe we can talk a little more about these processes in the Q and A if there's any time time left for it. But have morphed um, into, to some extent, um, what have provided a you know, discourse of justice and fairness uh, that that's a kind of um, extended. That's an extension of the rhetoric of equality of opportunity, as amended through, you know, what, what, you know, with affirmative action or whatever. That sort of uh, displaces um, uh, the, the class the class contradictions of neoliberal ca capitalism with a notion of of, a, of justice that looks more like parity along ascriptive group lines. And I think what, one of the ways that this has played out. Uh, that's 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 quite clear, is in the extent to which um, a language of racial disparity or gender you know, disparity has come to displace the language of of inequality or injustice, right? Um, because um, and we've seen this with you know you know uh, we've seen this with respect to um, to you know, discussion of the stock market crisis, whether the subprime, the mortgage crisis, um, um, you know, health disparities, and I've been curious about this phenomenon because, from from one perspective, there's nothing that's especially shocking to find that people who who are clustered at the bottom of the economic order are going to suffer disproportionately from from bad economic times, or that people who are, who are disproportionately poor are are, are going to have Worse, worse health outcomes. But what struck me has has uh, been a rhetorical trope of the of the scholarship, right? That the finding is announced first of all at, as a shocking finding. Uh, and um, I had a colleague once, I mean, year, year, years ago, who pointed out there are four essential components to a good social science um, um, piece of writing, right? Uh, one is it's more complicated than that. <laughs> <laughs> Another is the differences aren't that great. A third is some do, some don't. And and, and the fourth, and by all means the most important, is further research is needed. Um, <laughs> and the main conclusion of the disparity study seems to be a call for for you know, more research in in uh, in disparity. In fact, a colleague of mine in uh, the public health. Field just pointed out to me that um, one group of foundations has has um, put, put together a hundred million dollar fund um, to work on racial disparities in health, and 100 percent of the money is going to research on um, on racial disparities in health. Um, but but what struck me about this though is what's so appealing about you know the, the trope of disparity, right? Because people keep doing it. And they keep finding it, and 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 there seems to be a um, a presumption that that the announcement is somehow going to call forth uh, an ameliorative response. So there's a uh, and it's not clear what the presumption is. Um, partly, as I've just said, it's like the getting paid principle, right? I mean, that the more you do, right, the more you get paid to do. So there's that logic. But but I think it's also the case that 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 this discourse does does more with respect to a legitimizing de democratic ne neoliberalism than one might think at first blush, right? Uh, because there's a sense in which public acknowledgement of the existence of a disparity is public acknowledgement of the existence of an injustice, and acknowledgement of injustice is the first step to com to combating injustice. I mean, I recall when. Uh, on, on, on a couple cases, when 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 I was involved in uh, fights against Hope Six displacement, one one of one here, first one here, um, you know, the response from the housing authority types was yes, uh, we know about the urban renewal program and how unjust that was, and because we know, right, you, you can rest assured that that we will not re replicate it. Well, I suppose I don't need to say anything, do I? Um, you know how that plays out, 
And it may even be that especially in, 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 in a context of popular demobilization and processes of racialization of, of a putative um, underclass, um, that you don't need to do anything except announce a disparity. Uh, and that announcing that and that announcing an awareness of that the disparity uh, just does enough to salve the public conscience, right? That no further action is necessary. Um, now, it's in this sense that I think, and you probably noticed that those who came here to look for a discussion of a, of an anti-racism discourse. Just haven't gotten anything yet, uh, and I guess it should be clear by now. You're not going to get a whole lot unless you ask for it. But, uh, but, 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 but I would say that that I, that I think that the logic of of, of anti-racism as a politics does the same kind of work that that the logic of disparity as a political discourse does. And 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 I'll amplify that by making this point. I think one of the limitations. Of, of an anti-racist politics is that the object is 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 it is, is too amorphous, right? I, I mean, it's occurred to me it's kind of a provocative thing to say, but I mean, there's a sense in which um, in which anti-racism is attractive for the same reason that that anti-terrorism is, right? That that you can't find it, like it doesn't live in any place in particular and you, you can sort of find it wherever you need to find it and and it tends to to this place I, um, um, I've seen this a lot um, around the debates over um, re recovery and re reconstruction post Katrina down you know down, down in New Orleans that debate over whether and injustice qualifies as racism tends to displace um, um, a more strategic debate over how to fight the injustice okay? <laughs> and so, as you might imagine, since you know that's like the basic tap dance on on the anti-racism part of the talk. Well, <laughs> the what's going to be the rebuild the left part part of the talk, uh, and you won't be disappointed there either if you, if you brought your skepticism with you, right? Because there's not a lot to say about that actually. I mean, you know, I don't believe in the roadmaps. I don't believe in gimmicks. I don't believe you know, in in sort of if we could just, right? Um, if we just, if, you know, if we ran the right candidate, if we had the right program, if we had the right idea, and I mean the fact of the matter is that there's only one way to rebuild the left, uh, or to build the left, right? I mean depending on 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 the extent to which you feel that there was ever one, and the only way to do it is to find. Um, Find a political program and a discourse that can unite the many to defeat the few, that that can try that 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 can try um, you know, to build for the long term in the spirit of an organizing drive, right? To produce the kind of fundamental links and co connections among people who have to work for a living, or who are expected to work for a living, who are the vast majority of people in the country. Uh, you have to challenge your power, right? Um, and you know that's. Uh, and I think the first step, I, I, I think the first steps to being able to move in that direction effectively, are as I said at the outset to acknowledge that there is no left here, and that needs to be built from scratch, which means that we're not going to vote our way out of the situation because we didn't vote our way into it, right? And and that, that there's no alternative to the kind of. Um, Social movement building work that needs to go on. Now, uh, I, I mean, some some of those of you who who of you know me know you know I'm not a Panglossian guy and and I'm not a cheery sort of person, so I'm not going to end end on a note like that, right? But that last one just sounded um, um, you know too much like a Maoist slogan. <laughs> well, you know, I'm mean, those other place too. Don't get me wrong, um, but 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 I guess what I was going to say. Is that just as a sobering example of of the limits of electoralism? We as progressives got more from Richard Nixon than we got from Bill Clinton, or than we've gotten from Barack Obama, right? It's not because Nixon was a good man 
<laughs> it's you know, not because he was smart or because he had integrity. It's certainly not because he cared about us or about our concerns, right? I mean, I'm sure that both with both Obama and Clinton, like when they have their crises of, of, of self-doubt and stare at themselves in the mirror at three o'clock in the morning and wonder and muse about the vision of the America that they really want to see, what they wish for is much closer to what you know, all of us in this room, I assume, uh, would, would wish for than when it happened with Nixon. Because in, because with Nixon, in the first place, in his vision of America, most of us wouldn't be here. Uh, but what's the difference? But, I mean, the difference was that the organized movements of the left had social power, right? They, they had the social power to, to, to force OSHA on Nixon, right? You know, to force a, a social democratic agenda onto a recalcitrant Republican administration, right? None of us voted for him. I didn't vote for Humphrey either, which I'm, I'm still proud to say. Uh, um, right? And it didn't make any difference. And it still doesn't make, make any difference. Right? Uh, and I mean, that's what the task is. And, you know, look, I'm not, this also isn't like, uh, you know, hortatory call for everybody to go out and, you know, struggle to organize your workplace. I'm not saying that either. Right, um, right. I mean, a lot of different ways to 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 engage in politics, but but I think the key has to be right. You know, not to kid ourselves about where we are and what what the options are. Um, and and I will conclude with this. I mean, I don't know how. I mean, how many of you noticed? But it's no accident, as my father's generation used to say, um, that that there hasn't been the kind of public um, the uproar um, about the continuing and the deepening economic crisis that we we're experiencing that we might have imagined. And, and there are a couple of recent studies that have made very clear why. It's because in the class that talks about this stuff, and that's our class, and that's also increasingly you know, the class that's in charge of big sectors of the trade union movement, but that's another story, um, things just aren't so bad, right? Um, the professional managerial strata have a rate of unemployment now and 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 a rate of underutilization that approximates what is now known as full employment. But you look down the SES ladder a couple of notches, right? And that there's a whole different story. And as my good friend, the late the late Anthony Mazaki used to say all the time, that as this thing continues to unravel, right? People who are hurting are going to look for answers and for options, and we all know that there are really dangerous forces out there that 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 have sort of internally consistent, reasonable sounding accounts um, about who's responsible. And if the likes of us can't commit ourselves to find ways to produce alternative kinds of accounts that are credible and plausible and speak to real people's needs then think things are going to get just as ugly in this country as they've ever been. So on that cherry note, <laughs> if my ball control office has not worked and I haven't chewed up all the clock, we'll, we'll have some questions. Okay, anybody? Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Well, I guess I deserve it. <laughs> um, you were saying near the beginning of the talk, uh, at least this is how I heard it, that one account of um, the movement left, such as it is, its relationship to uh, the Democratic Party, and might be the class composition. Um, um, I take it of the sort of apparatchiks, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I just was interested to hear what you would say about the counterparts on the on the right, to the extent that they've been successful in, um, you know, turning the Republican Party into a fairly ideological party. And of right. course, that's a that's a mixed success. I don't want right. to exaggerate. It. Right. Um, do you uh, attribute that 
partly to uh, their class composition, or how would you how would you think about it? Yeah, I mean that is an interesting question, right? Uh, partly, I mean they do this better than we do, right? I mean they've read you know not just Goebbels, but they've read Gramsci, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I don't know what the hell we read, but. Um, um, I was talking to Doug Henwood a few weeks ago. He made the observation that that the Democrats look look weak and incoherent, while the Republicans don't, because while they have a common um, shtick, right? Right. I mean, like the Republicans are are a capitalist party with with, with a right tail, right? That's not pro-capitalist, you know, necessarily. Um, I mean, the Democrats are a capitalist party that's got a left tail. That's certainly not pro-capitalist, right? Like in, a, like in a conventional sense. But a significant difference is that that the right tail on the Republican side, I think, is probably you know maybe more strategically driven by uh, by a class-conscious fraction of the PMC, right? Uh, that that is kind of hooked hooked into um, you know, the, you know capitalist class imperatives. And partly to that extent, I think the agenda of the of the Republican um, of the Republican electoral base or the mass electoral base doesn't come anywhere near near the economic issues, uh, and that makes it a little more comfortable for them to fashion you know kind of alliance, right? So that you you can tell you know like the right winger who I mean I love the fact that they call themselves. You know, the tea baggers anyway. But <laughs> I just read the Village of Voice way too long. Not that long ago with that. But but um, but but I mean, like like you tell the people who um, who you know want full voting rights for every zygote and 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 who want um, you know constitutional uh, but a constitutional amendment um, you know, to acknowledge the Flintstones view of evolution. <laughs> That the best way for them to get that is to cut the capital gains tax and <laughs> the state tax, right? And it kind of works, right? Because they understand the principle of, of a political alliance, right? Where, where where I internalize that the way for me to get what I want is to take your issue as mine, right? The Democrats have a problem, though, right? Because their fringe constituency, their popular electoral base is explicitly committed to an agenda of downward economic re downward economic redistribution. Right? So they so they can't manage their base in the same way that their minions on the right can, right? And 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 as Doug contended, right, I mean that's why the Democrats tend to look weak, weak and incoherent. And they make up part of the you know, uh, I, I mean, put it this way, but, but they have to make up shit like you know the filibuster proof majority, right? As, as a preemptive excuse, right? Uh, I mean, our friends and I like you know sometimes sit around and sort of you know joke about the best way to explain a relationship or 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 to characterize a relationship between the labor movement in particular and and the Democrats. You know, sometimes it's like um, abused child, right? I mean, and, and sometimes it's like um, battered spouse, right? I mean, like, I, if I give you another $85 million, you probably won't hit me anymore. But what we finally came came up with, I think, is the best, is is, is like 2 a.m. booty call, <laughs> right? I mean, they come by, whether they get the money, whether they go on, they won't be seen with us in public. Right? Uh, <laughs> And then the minions from, say, uh, Jared Bernstein and whoever you can think of from the Center for American Progress will, you know, tell us, well, yeah, I know. He's always out with her in public, and he looks like he's happy. But he's assured me that as soon as that baby that they just had gets out of medical school, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so I think that's a part of the problem, right? Um, uh, but, but I think it's also the case that partly because um, I mean, I think that, and and I mean, this is maybe another kind of cut on it, right? That that I think that um, that the Democrats' base in in uh, the in uh, the movement intelligentsia, right, comes comes out of the foundations and uh, the advocacy groups itself, right? 
um, where I think on the right, it's a little more the case, I, I could be wrong about this, but, but my sense is that it's a little more the case that, 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 that it comes out of the central Republican apparatus and, and, and like goes out to those groups, right? You know, the Heritage Foundation, um, a couple of years ago, bought a thousand apartments in DC, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm in the district, right, to house their operatives, right? And the kids they were bringing in, right? Um, I'm to train and get them out there. And they're still doing that kind of stuff. Now, is the response, as some of, of the Center for American Progress types would say, you know, that, that, that the liberal think tanks should do that too? Uh, not really, because they don't have anything to offer anybody, really. Right, right, except ways to get some more funding for liberal think tanks, ultimately, right? Because they're uh, um, maybe you know the model of what happened to the right after the defeat of Goldwater is perhaps a little closer to the idea, right? That um, you know, I, I I was just saying, saying to a friend that that uh, you know, mutatis mutandis. It's kind of like what what uh, what what the Maoists did after the, the defeat of the Canton uprising in 1928, right? They got routed, and the lesson that they drew from it was: we moved too soon. It's time to back up and organize, right? And what what did the left do after um, you know the riding of, of the majority of the government? Right, it got shell shocked and swallowed Jimmy Carter basically, and you know was swallowing ever since then. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, is that responsive? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, you pre uh, present a very compelling picture of, of the destruction of the left over the past 30 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to know if you could elaborate why you thought a left was still necessary or even desirable. Despite your claims to the contrary, mm -hmm. um, you did end on a hortatory note. Mm -hmm. um, That's true. You're claiming the left should be organizing around a program to. Uh, uh, advance people's immediate interests. But it seems as though you don't need a left for that. There are trade unions, there are community associations, there is in fact the Democratic Party. If the left has a purpose, it seems to be to serve a long-term political right. goal. And if so, right. how do you square that with the incapacity um, or the um, uh, uh, the impossibility even of constructing a left? Mm -hmm. that would actually address people's immediate issues. Right. No, that's a good question. Um, well, first, I guess I first have to acknowledge that you caught me on the auditory thing, and you found me out, or you outed me. Um, um, yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction there, actually. I mean, I think, well, I guess you can just, 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 just you compel me to out myself completely, so I'm, I'm now going to do it. Um, I mean, the trade union sector is the trade union sector, and it's only and 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 it's ever going to be the trade union sector, right? Um, what we need is a class, you know, self-conscious class-based kind of political phenomenon or 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 a political formation, and and there's a lot of room to talk about the kind of formation that it's going to be. It may be that we need to have multiple kinds, right? Um, um, I've been, you know, over the past year or so, uh, you know, developing some relationships with the German Left Party, and I mean, other groups like that. We've been talking, and as some some of you know, I've, you know, I've been involved in the Labour Party here. And that's an expression of a comparable kind of approach to 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 a project. And my um, comrades and brothers and sisters in um, you know, that project have been talking about next steps and and what ways to try to move. I mean, it's, um, I think that whatever gets built here has to be built up on the trade union foundation, right? For the same reason that Willie Sutton said he robbed banks, right? Because that's where the money was, right? The trade unions are where, are where, where the workers are, right? I know, I know, I know, I know. 7%, 9%, 5% of, of, of uh, working people. To, to what I always say, compared to what? Right. I mean, what else you got this back? Right. Um, so, but you know, that's the base, right? That's that's where the resources are. That's where that's where you know the organizational talent is, right? And capacity. So the trick is now, just as the trick has been since the 1920s, the 1930s, 1940s, like whenever you want to figure it, 
how to connect with 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 you know with that base and 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 to build a left in and and around it. Not exclusively in the union sector, certainly, but that's that's that that that's where the key institutional nodes I think have, you know have to be. But no, I mean you're right. I mean um, see because I think we've reached the point now, right? Um, um, I was talking um, you know to a couple of people like before um, in this event. You know, whatever state I find myself in, uh, our sector, our mo most immediate sector, public higher education, is under fatal assault. And there's an attempt here from 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 the colleagues, you know, to form a union, and, and that's great. It's important. Of course, I applaud it. At this point, that's not enough, right? Um, right. I mean, we can't depend on a politics that sort of so circle the wagons when we're under attack, because the Fordist compromise is dead. And th this is a problem that's endemic in the trade union movement now, failure to recognize the practical implications of the fact that the Fordist compromise is dead. Right? And we find ourselves increasingly stuck in practicing last one out, turn off the lights kind of trade unionism. It's especially true in, in, in the industrial sector. It's, it's you know, no less true. I think in the other sectors as well. I mean, even those those new trade unions that seek that um, you know, offer this as their comparative advantage, um, you know, being able to manage the working class for you know for employers better. Um, and and what, what that means is we've got to try to find ways to build on that base, though, to take the struggle out beyond the workplace, and that means our workplace, right? Um, I mean, some some of you probably also know that you know, I've been involved for a while in trying to put, push a campaign for free public higher education, right? At, right as a way, at a minimum, to start a conversation going in in the broader society about what this what higher education is as a social good, what what the public is for God's sake anymore, right? Since you know, since that's about lost, that, that that's frankly what got me involved in AUP in the first place, uh, but. Um, you know, not not that can look. I'm not selling that campaign necessarily, but what, what I'm trying to sell is is that sort of approach. You know, you know to trying to organize, right? To 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 broaden the base, right? For a vision, frankly, for an open and and affirmative vision of what the society would look like if it were governed by and in the interest of the vast majority of people who actually live here, right? I mean, what I mean, one of the things that strikes me is so ironic about. Um, you, you know the way that this accommodations leftism stuff goes is is that the practical um, projects that you know the liberals take are no less utopian in the context of of, of a neoliberal dominance than than something that that we actually want, right? I mean, look what well, the healthcare thing is a perfect perfect example of that. How could we be worse off if Obama had drawn a line in the dirt and said no? Bucket, single pay. <laughs> right? But, but, but I mean, how could we be worse off now than we are if, if he'd done that? Um, so, I mean, how do you get to that point? Well, sadly, like, like you don't get to that point by going around giving speeches. Right? Um, I'm, I, 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 I mean, like, you get to it by, what well, the only way to get to it is the slow grind. And, and the meticulous way that you build movements, right? You're building the little connections and the bases, you know, the solidarities, by, you know, by drinking beer with people and talk to, and, and uh, comparing notes about your pain in the ass grandmother by, you know, going, going to softball games, you know, right? And that's what you do. And, and that's the only way you do it. And it may not seem that we have time to do it, right? Um, you know, because the quality of the danger is so great. But the fact is that it doesn't matter. Right? And see, this is another entailment, I think, of the call to recognize that there is no left. Because there is something that's a little emancipating about that re recognition, right? Because it frees us up, for instance, from the need to read the daily body count and to declaim about it, right? Because we have no control of it, right? I mean, no matter who Amy Goodman thinks she's, she's talking to, she's, she's just talking to her friends, right? 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 I mean, she's not... Um, 
moving the national debate, right? So, um, um, I mean, I know I'm kind of speechifying, but but I'll give you another anecdote. Like a few years ago, I was out here, you know, stuck on the drive. That's hardly newsworthy. Um, and um, and there wasn't anything playing on the radio stations that I would, you know, normally listen to in a rental car. Uh, and um, that W bourgeoisie was just more offensive than they are as a rule. So, but I stumbled across Christian radio, and this, this was when the first the first of the Harry Potter films was out. I didn't know anything from Harry Potter at all, except that the yuppies that I rode the train with um, from Grand Central every day seemed to read it and buy it for their kids. So I learned, first of all, that there was a two-line struggle among the Holy Rollers, right, um, about this that had to do with um, demons and sorcery. So that so that, that was a passing snide interest for about a minute or two. But what mesmerized me for the rest of the three days I was out here, so I couldn't wait to get in the car to listen, <laughs> was the role that Christian Wright Radio was playing, right? Because it stood by, as, as, as such a marked contrast to Pacifica and KPF and, and WBAI and whatever else, because they understood this as as an issue for a movement, right? So every host that, that, that I heard, every talking head who came on had a line. And they came together around the line. And the line was basically this, that there are good and true Christians on both sides of this issue. If you think it's OK to let your kids read the books and watch the movies with adequate, with adequate supervision, that's fine. <laughs> Just don't do it in a way that, that throws it in the face of people who, who, who I think it's a sacrilege or whatever Protestants have. Um, and they even found a way to find a, a scriptural foundation for this, uh, which I have no idea if this is true or not, what they said, because one of the things they say about Catholics is really true is that we don't read the Bible. But, uh, <laughs> so I don't know what's in that thing. But, but, uh, uh, but, this, but, but, but according to them, there's a thing in St. Paul about, what, uh, about the, the propriety of, of, um, of consuming meat that's, that's been that was sacrificed to a pagan idol. And, 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 and according to them, I mean, those of you that know the Bible, you know, tell me if this is true or not. Um, Paul said, well, all right, yeah, 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 it's okay to do it, but don't do it in, do it, do it in a way that affronts those who think, think it's a sacrifice, basically. But I couldn't help, help but make the contrast, right? Part of the difference, of course, is that it's a commercial enterprise and they've got a market share to preserve. I, 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 I mean, that's cool. But another part of the difference is that they understand themselves to be the organic uh, venue for a movement. And their first task is to hold the movement together. And, and they kept making that point over and over and over. There's a disagreement here, but you got to remember there's a deeper connection, right, that, that we, we all share, and, and we have to hold that. Now, we don't have that on our side. And there are many reasons that we don't. And I think one reason that we don't um, is that we've sort of given up. Well, is 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 we've fallen into the electoralitis. We've we've fallen into the accommodation to liberals. I mean, and 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 I, I said before I'm as guilty of that as anybody. I mean, after the substance of Reaganism became clear, then um, I spent the bulk of the '80s swallowing stuff. To you know, vote for Democrats. There were parts of the world that I felt that I couldn't afford to look at anymore, right, 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 right because of what glancing at them would do to the alliance I was trying to build. But you know, you know, you build left wing Democratic Party, and uh, try, try as he did to make it impossible for me. Uh, not even, not, not even Ariel Sharon. Um, yeah, you know, could you know could. Could, could completely deter me from, you know, from that objective, shame to say. But, um, but Clintonism won, right? There is no left of center wing of the Democratic Party, right? Uh, there is no space for left in you know, mainstream American politics. And, what's, and what, what's emancipating about that, again, is that you know, we don't have to bother with um, you know how to appeal to the liberals, right? Because we can't. 
And so, I mean, what that means then is like the ultimate object, or, or, I'm, or I mean, the only objective is, is to try to find, find ways to build a working class politics. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, part, I mean, I, there's a, I have so much to say about you so that I can't possibly say it. So. Uh, so that's a great talk. Oh, um, thanks. Okay. So a glass of wine and talk some more. Uh, and I wanted to say I really agree with you about Obama. In fact, I was Obama's professor when he was at Columbia, and I taught him Marx and Gramsci, and obviously it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that's kind of, you know, you probably, it's a response you probably want. You've been waiting for this, so I'll give it to you. Uh, it seems to me that the rhetorical stand that you take when you give this talk mm -hmm. is part of a variant of the move of outlefting, in this case, the audience. You know, and what you're saying is, but you do it, you do it in a way that makes you even, by saying that there is no left, mm -hmm. it actually takes you almost out of the situation. But um, the thing that I found was I wanted you to talk more about was you gave a kind of um, an insular history of the left in the academy. Right. And you kind of left out the big thing. You know, globalization, corporate capital, global corporate capitalism, right. and what possible responses there could be to a left movement. And and I think I feel like you also, um, by by kind of doing this kind of outlefting thing, you're kind of not paying attention to what there is of the left. You know, and I think that there is. I mean, where is the left in America? You know, it's not in trade unions. I mean, the trade unions, you know, are famously known for their. I mean, they represent a certain kind of of compromise between ameliorism and, you know, representing a certain class of workers. And even you said here that trade unionism wasn't a solution here at USC because it's circling the wagons. Right. So, um, in fact, if you look around the country, there's there are groups like the, the Labor Party, but, you know, let's face it, right? So, but, but academia actually is an area where leftism is doing the kind of thing you were talking about. It's, it's, it's keeping it alive. It's you know, doing the small things, it's teaching generations of people, and it's doing it in, in a, I think, a specific <laughs> response to the inability of, of, of a different kind, of an older kind of Marxism, to combat global capitalism. And, you know, so, I mean, it is a question of what kinds of moves are relevant or necessary. And uh, I wouldn't just throw that away in one yeah. second. I mean, I think that there's, the other thing is that the old left, and I think you're representing kind of old left, I mean, like a, the new left, in regard to the old left, this kind of leftism is a kind of old left in regard to, yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Right. What? Yeah, so, you know, it, it, what it failed to do is to reproduce itself in the next generation. Right. I mean, just as you need the reproduction of workers, you need to reproduce the leftists. Right. And it, it failed for a number of reasons. Um, but, so you can't look, I think you can't look for that kind of, you know, uh, leftism that works with, uh, you know, large groups of people, uh, you know, tr looking for something that looks like revolution in, a, in some kind of other form. But, you know, there, I mean, we're, we're, there's a lot to be said about organization, the internet, the way that ordinary people can get information. There is a real left presence, I think, I would argue, on the internet. And it, ha it takes a different form and shape. So just to say, like, well, it doesn't really count is, feels like dismissive in a kind of way that's not regarding the changes that have happened. Well, okay. real changes in, right. in response to real uh, big issues. Right. Yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, no, I've got to take your point. Um, uh, I mean, especially, well, yeah, in fact, you did put a number of things up on the stage. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Um, well, yeah, with respect to the impact of globalization, et cetera, uh, yeah, I mean, I admit, I didn't talk about that. Uh, I mean, it's kind of the backdrop, right, for what, what I think happened. Um, that's that, that's a big chunk of the backdrop of of the demobilization that 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 I referred to but didn't discuss, uh, and that's a chunk of it. Um, with respect to stuff, um, um, to two other points. One is I mean the stuff that we can do in you know, in the academy. I I I I certainly grant that right. You know with the reproduction of students and the like. I, I admit, I've gotten mixed emotions about that over the years. I mean, there was a time, for instance, and this may even um, be kind of an affirmation of the criticism that you, you make of the trade union movement. There, yeah, I mean, there was a time when students came to me and said that they wanted to go to work in the labor movement. I'd say great and, and encourage them. Now I see the dynamics of how that plays out and what, what happens when you come from Swarthmore and Penn and 
Oberlin and Chicago and Northwestern and go to the OI and then go to SEIU and work on the Blitz campaigns that are like the equivalent of, of the unpaid corporate internships that your cousins do, right? With where they take advantage of the capacity for super self self exploitation, mm -hmm. and then you either burn 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 out and go to law school or go on staff and become the new managers of 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 the low wage black black and brown workers. I figure I can't do that, right? Um, so, um, and it's funny like my son teaches down down in Bloomington Normal at ISU, and like every the you know, other year, he calls me about some student of his who comes from you know a union family like Peoria, you know, or in Decatur or or, or Bloomington, who's gotten pumped and he wants to go to work in the labor movement. And there's no version of the OI that goes there. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. I've been able now and again, right, you know, to shake an old contact from around here to you know, help somebody get on someplace. But there's something rotten that's happening inside the trade union movement too, right? That's consistent with the logic of neoliberalization and its ideological hegemony. And it's, and you know, I'm not just saying that because the, uh, um, the, uh, the cup, uh, because the colors of, of, of uh, my arch rival high school were purple and gold, but, uh, um, but that said, Right. It, yes. I mean, it is important that we can do what we do with, with 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 our students, and that's and I mean I agree that that's a moment, right? I mean that's the equivalent of you know I mean going I mean that's the equivalent of of the organizing class basically. What as far as the internet stuff is concerned, well, see I think there we we're just gonna have to disagree. I just don't have 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 have, have much. I mean, it's striking to me that before a shot was fired in in uh, the war in Iraq, there was a level of the opposition in in the polls to an intervention that was as high as it was in Vietnam, or, or the, that that was higher than it was in Vietnam until close to the Tet Offensive, right? But it hasn't been converted, right? And yeah, I just don't think that that's um, Yes, it, yes, I think it's possible. It, it's possible to be much more rapidly informed than it was like a decade ago. But but I think that one, one of the problems that we face is that being on the left has come in, in part to me being really really well informed about you know the way we're going to shit kicked out of us all over the world. <laughs> so so I'm kind of let, let less enthusiastic, but, but I'd love to talk talk to you about more of a glass of wine. Walter, do you want to make the last comment? Do you have your hand up? I had a problem that you well, go out with one. No, no. Go <laughs> on. There's going to be, be a seminar later in the week, but and the, this is actually as much responding to Lenny's question. I mean, it's sort of almost a question for Lenny, although a rhetorical question which he's not supposed to answer. <laughs> 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 this is the question be, some often in your talk today, and often in your work, um, the left is identified with an anti capitalist. Um, and let's say we stick with that. And then the question would be is, well, what? In what part of the academy does the anti-capitalist side uh, continue? I mean, I can see lots of liberalism in the academy, and lots of sort of what counts sort of demographically as more liberal than most people in America with respect to lots of the issues that people are concerned with, like disability stuff, like gender, like the question of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, sort of a whole set of questions around sexuality and racial identity, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not only hard to see them as embodying an anti-capitalist uh, optics, it's rather, it's incredibly easy to see them as an act embodying a sort of left male liberal politics um, among the lines you've sketched out. So I, I guess my question is, why are you so ready, or perhaps it's just because you want to get the line, why are you so ready to accept the characterization of the academy, the university, as being sort of one of the last bastions of that politics? Because mm -hmm. I would actually just be much more inclined to say, when I give these talks, it is always an attack on the audience talk. 
Yeah, you know, the academy is a kind of bastion of conservative politics, mm -hmm. which is to say a left neoliberalism as a way of legitimizing, legitimizing, right. legitimizing or legitimizing. Right. right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's right in general. But, but I mean, here, here's an illustration that 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 I think also uh, speaks to your point. Um, you know, I came here from from a symposium down in New Orleans, right? That that was organized by a guy who's an anthropologist at the University of New Orleans, who did a book on on you know, Latin America and and a book on the chicken industry, uh, and and the guy who's a postdoc at Tulane that that was anchored that 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 was held at UNO, and the point of it was you know to bring together those local trade union leaders, which, you know, which includes like the president of the Central Labor Council who comes from Chalmette in St. Bernard Parish and comes out of the IBEW. He's a good friend of my cousin. He came up together in that book. But he's like a classic building trade. By the woman from SEIU, two, two or three other unions. The, the, the people who are working, who, who, who are doing basically trade union organizing with, um, with um, um, Two, two different streams of, of um, undocumented and, and, and uh, of, 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 of undocumented alien labor um, you know, out of the worker centers there um, and, um, and others of, of, of social movement activists, um, people who are fighting against um, public housing displacement uh, and for first source hiring ordinances and wage theft uh, with, you know, waste, waste theft ordinances and 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 and, and the hospitality sector campaign. So now th th this is not the kind of stuff that goes on you know, within the academy in general. And 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 of course the fancier the institution, you know, the less likely it is to go on. But there are still kind of some spaces at, at, at some points in 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 the academy where it's possible to function as as you know, nodes. To support this kind of activity, but you know, but that doesn't privilege the university as a sector, which which I'm not doing. I mean, I just uh, so I'm, so I'm that's between you two guys. <laughs> I'm not supposed to respond. There's a lot more to say. I want to invite everyone to Genesis and reception to thank you so much. I'm going to break protocol for one second. Just one line. So where is the critique of neoliberalism? Is it anti-capitalist? What?